the children a substantial portion of our client's paycheck, at least in the form of child support and potentially in the form of maintenance, and the better part of my last Hello, this is Joe Cordell. Welcome back to another episode of Cash Council. We're talking about ways in which you can make transfers of assets during your lifetime to minimize estate taxes, to achieve your goals in terms of the way you want your, your life's efforts distributed. And we found that there are a lot of considerations to think about. We've talked about you know, the various taxes involved. There are income taxes, there are gift taxes, there are estate taxes. We're talking about how you integrate those and how they may potentially conflict depending on which road you go down. It may be helpful in, as in terms of gift taxes, not helpful in terms of income taxes. It may be neutral in terms of estate. Uh, so you have to often do a netting process. You have to calculate those and, and uh, determine what is the net effect. And meanwhile, you have to do this all the time while you have a sort of moving target because we all recognize that the nature of taxes is they continually change. Rarely, however, do they continually change downward. So typically what's happening with taxes is they go up. But, but when you do estate planning, you're doing it in a sort of dynamic environment. It's an environment that's continually changing, and, and often you don't know that point in the future even when you want to ask what will be the conditions at that time. So, so, so you're struggling with a lot of uncertainty here. You, you, even if you knew the, the date in which these all might be triggered, the date of your death, for example, even if you knew that, you still would have a lot of uncertainty. But magnifying that is the fact that you don't know when that point might occur. It could occur today. It could occur 40 years from now. So it's, it's under these, these uh, cloudy circumstances that you've got to struggle with these issues and make decisions. And what we're wanting to accomplish here is to, is to make you more capable as a client to be helpful to your attorney. You know, we're assuming that, that in explaining these things to you that you're not going to prepare your own legal documents. Don't prepare your own legal documents. I mean, I, I, I don't have a horse in this race, so to speak. I mean, whoever you're going to go to, I wish you the best. I would say choose somebody who does a lot of estate planning. And, but, but I'll tell you what I've, what I've told my brother in a similar conversation. It's just nutty to try to save a few thousand bucks even whenever you're talking about your lifetime's effort. Now, if it turns out that your lifetime's effort is a couple thousand bucks, then, then maybe, maybe the, I, I would make an exception for you. But I suspect that the people I'm talking to here, you've accumulated a lot because you've worked very hard, you've had a lot of discipline, you've used good judgment over the years. You've used good judgment about professionals in your businesses. You know, you, you hired accountants when you should, you hired uh, engineers when you should, you've hired other attorneys when you should. And, and certainly, estate planning should be no different. But I do see this trend that concerns me it concerns me because I, I, I see people who feel that, that there's one vanilla uh, envelope, so to speak, that they can pull off of a shelf, take out a form, and that that form will be as effective for them as the, their neighbor down the street or, heaven forbid, somebody in another part of town. I mean, it's just, it's just not realistic and it's not true. The bottom line is that there does have to be some customization in estate planning. And again, I don't have a horse in this race. It, you know Cordell and Cordell does uh, focuses on representing men in domestic relations situations. The services that we provide you in cash counsel is simply a way to, to provide you supplemental benefits, so to speak, uh, to give you supplemental information that we know is relevant. We know from representing guys in domestic relations cases, many, many of them executives and business owners, that, that issues related to asset protection, which includes estate planning, issues related to asset protection are huge. So I decided to take my time regularly to do this show in an effort to better equip you to be more effective. I mean, the whole idea with our clients is that we want them to walk away and be successful and be happy, rebuild their lives. And, and in order to do that, this is information you need. But I do see a trend where there's a, there's a tendency to go out and, and through websites and other places and get forms and do estate planning on that basis. And I can just tell you that that's an awful idea. Having said that, I'm going to assume none of you are even contemplating going down that road. Or if you were, my, the, the power of my argument just utterly dismissed that idea. So as a result, you're going to be going to a lawyer. And in going to a lawyer, though, you can't go simply as this putty that the lawyer is going to direct and mold and shape. Instead, you have to have in mind what that ultimate shape is going to be. You have to have you know, very, a great deal of clarity, hopefully, 
about where you want to end up. And, and of course the lawyer will make certain assumptions. The lawyer can safely assume you want to pay less taxes than more. The lawyer can, can assume that you want to have the highest level of certainty regarding the specific plan that, that you lay out. But it still requires something of you. It requires that you communicate what, what you're wanting to do and you have um, some understanding of what the range of options are. And, and particularly when your lawyer is using a lot of technical terminology. And unfortunately in this field there's a lot of technical terminology. And it's, it's, it's important for you to get some sense for what that means. I'll have to tell you that if you watch these series that we're doing now, uh, related to, for example, estate planning, or I'd also argue if you watch these series related to any other areas of asset protection, that, that the attorney that you go in to see will be wowed by the fact that here I have a client that I don't have to start on the most elemental level and explain the, the, the basics to them, or worse, and what I think is the more common practice, is just zoom past it, throw in the technical terms, you nod your head not wanting to appear dumb, and they put it on a form, present it to you for signature, and you sign. That's, that's worse than, than spending the additional money to, to try to get up to speed in the process with that lawyer. But better still is the option that we offer here. And we offer you the opportunity to become much more knowledgeable and as a result much more effective in terms of achieving your goals related to asset protection. All right, enough said on that. Let me take the next few minutes and, and um, dive into this topic that we want to cover today. We're talking about ways in which you can you can uh, move assets around during your lifetime that will minimize your estate taxes, maximize the chances you achieve your goals. We talked about two broad ways in which that's done. One, there, there can be gifts. Another, there can be a sale. The difference essentially from the IRS perspective is that a sale is something for value. A gift has to be completed. Uh, it has to be uh, a bona fide transfer in which there is less than adequate and full consideration. Those are kind of technical phrases that appear. An exchange is the converse of that. An exchange or a sale, rather, but requires that there be some consideration and that, that consideration reflect the fair market value of what is given up. And to the extent there's a shortfall, and this is important, to the extent that there's a shortfall in that you, for example, convey a farm worth a million dollars and you get back assets that would otherwise be valued, whether it's notes, whether it's, uh, whether it's cash, whatever it might be, valued at half that. So what you have there is a sort of um, hybrid transaction. It's a transaction in which you have a sale, but what else do you have? You have a gift. You have a sale and a gift that occurred in that transaction. And the IRS is very attentive to these deals. They're not going to simply look to whether or not something passed back across the table and then bless it as a sale, the entire transaction. As a matter of fact, most of the questionable transactions, those that end up in litigation, do involve this sort of hybrid transaction in which there, there is a purported sale, there is an exchange of value, but it's less than, at least in the IRS's opinion, less than the value of, of what was given up. So what the IRS will do is they'll grab that transaction, they'll say yes, there was a sale as to half and a gift as to half. So whenever we're talking about gifting versus sales, we have to consider the possibility of doing a hybrid. And incidentally, this third category I just mentioned, where it's part sale, uh, uh, part gift, that's very common to be done intentionally, where it's not a misstep, where the IRS suddenly pops up and, and says, we're going to call part of this a gift or part of sale. Instead, it's often a part of the plan to, to do a transaction where you deliberately structure it that you receive less in consideration from what the asset's worth that you're transferring. So those are the sort of large categories when you talk about lifetime exchanges. Now what's going on as we contemplate here? What should we do? Well, we know that we minimize estate taxes to the extent that we reduce the value of the assets that exist in your estate at your death. That's easy. We also know that to the extent we do a transfer during a lifetime, we're potentially at risk for gift taxes. And it might trigger an income tax issue uh, more likely in a transaction during your lifetime than in a transaction at death. There are some assets that trigger income taxes at death, but those are called uh, income respecting decedent assets, ERDs, IRDs, and, and we'll reserve that discussion for a different show. So really we're, we're considering what's the implications if we decide that we want to go ahead and move this asset out of your estate, so to speak, so it's not going to be there when you die. Why might you consider doing that? We've talked about some things already, but let me add some other points here. 